Well, welcome to today's company clinic. We have a special one-off feature uh, today talking about Carillion. And um, I have Joe Kettner and Dennis Baker from Company Watch to talk about uh, Carillion and what it faced. Hi, Dennis. I, I think it's worth, um, thank you, Anna, for, for introducing us. It's, it's worth um, having a little think about Carillion. It's obviously been a lot in the news recently and since January when it actually went into administration, we're still having to hear about the fallout even now, um, and I suspect it's likely to go on for quite a lot longer. So I wondered if you could just have a, a, a quick talk through about the background to, to Carillion um, and why it, it all went so horribly wrong. Sure. Okay. Uh, Carillion is, I think, one of the largest UK failures in, in recent history. Uh, one of the largest construction companies in the UK and outsourcing and I'll just give a view of the company watch view of, of Carillion, which was uh, just just to remind everyone how our, our score works. It all, all companies go from zero to 100. 100 is the strongest, zero is the weakest, weakest. Any company that falls at 25 or below means they're now amongst a group that could potentially fail. And, and virtually all companies that fail will come from the warning area. Now, Carillion failed in January, February this year. And of course, we had them in the warning area uh, based on their interims in June 2017. But uh, we did have them out of the warning area in December 2016. So here's Carillion going along uh, out of the warning area. And once their interims came through, they plunged directly into the warning area, deep into the warning area. And before anything, before I go into the numbers, I'll just go through the factor profile, the strengths and weaknesses of, of this company. And this is a very interesting profile. Uh, this explains, this factor profile explains the H score, which is the dark line, of course. Um, this line here is how well they're managing the profits statistically. So that was reasonably strong throughout until, of course, the July, uh, the June uh, results. And the bars are how well they're managing the balance sheet statistically. And this has been weak throughout. So they've had a weak balance sheet all the way through. And any time you see a profile like this, you know the company's fine so long as the profits are there. If the profits fail, there's nothing or, or, or disappear, there's nothing to fall back on. We call this a water skier type of profile, where if the profit boat uh, is pulling the company along, everything's fine. As soon as the profits disappear or evaporate, there's nothing to fall back on. So this is a classic water skier type profile. And the balance sheet week all the way along, it's fine so long as the profits are there. As soon as the profits disappear, it plunges straight into the warning area. And that's the overall profile. And could you just talk, talk to us a little bit too, about the, the balance sheet? You say it's, it's weak. Can you see that from the numbers um, themselves if you, if you look at the account? Yes. So uh, just I'll just jump to the actual uh, accounts. So this is done in, in standard format. Actually, it's worth seeing the uh, published accounts just to get a feel for the optimism of Carillion in 2016, making today uh, tomorrow a better place. Not today, but tomorrow. Not quite. Yeah. Quite and everything quite. looked, you know, total revenue, all very optimistic look and very uh, um, giving a very positive picture of Carillion. But I'll just go back to uh, the company watch view. So this is uh, Carillion. You can see between 2013 and 2016, it's up by 1 billion. The so sales jumped by almost a third in the three years to 2016. So very, very positive. In two th uh, if you look at their profits, their profits also went up, went uh, from 110 million to 146 million. So what's the problem? So operationally, up to 2016, they were doing very, very well. If you look at the balance sheet, this is where uh, this is where the problems are highlighted. They're sitting with a, with a, a huge intangible asset. So the largest asset, by some distance, is the goodwill, the intangible fixed assets. Can you tell us what, what is goodwill? Goodwill is, is the, not in the uh, accounting yes, notes. Yes. Goodwill is the excess of the amounts paid by a company when they acquire another company. So if they acquire a company for uh, 500 million, they pay 2 billion, 1.5 billion is the goodwill. 
I see. And what is that essentially? That's that's what they expect that's the, to get there. That's the excess of what they've paid, and it is what they're hoping to achieve in super profits in future years. It's quite an optimistic. Um, it's an optimistic uh, view, and they, they believe the, the company has the value, and they put it there. But essentially, it's air. There's nothing there. There's nothing uh, to support. It's just simply what Carillion thought. Uh, the companies that they've acquired uh, is worth in excess of what they actually uh, uh, receive from those companies. So that's the biggest asset. Uh, the rest of the uh, of the balance sheet shows current assets of 1.6 billion. That sorry, uh, uh, let me go back to 2016. So it, the in fact, uh, what I'll do is I'll hide I'll, I'll hide the interims over there. So this is what uh, the 2016 numbers, they had a intangible asset of 1.6 billion. And when you look at the uh, working capital, they had 2.2 billion of current assets and 2.2 billion of working capital. So virtually all, uh, all their current liabilities were just about covered by their current assets. And in a situation like that, you know, this company really needs to receive, make sure they realize they're their, the their debtors. They, they're getting the cash in, mm -hmm. they're converting their debtors into cash quick enough. And as we know, we believe that some of these receivables were not received. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's when the problems start. So this is what somebody looking at that company watch um, after the December accounts came out, obviously not, or not in December, but around March, March time would have seen um, in the company watch system. So they would have actually seen quite a, a an okay looking company on the surface but you know, okay looking okay. coming from from the uh, uh, operations point of view mm -hmm. from the balance sheet the working capital was very finely tuned and anytime you know you have a problem with the receivable the, the company would be in trouble and also most of the funding most of the debt that they have on the balance sheet is funding the intangible asset so they've borrowed they're sitting with a lot of debt and a lot of uh, liabilities paying for that goodwill which is uh, hope, basically. a hope, that's mm -hmm. right. It's worth saying that even while I'll, I'll, I'll show the interims again, while they, once the interims came out, even though companies had the warning, if you look at the, uh, the timeline of Carillion, this, uh, this is an interesting story, uh, if I get to the timeline. Uh, let me just go back. How do I do this? I think if you just scroll, scroll down, are you looking at the... Um Uh, if I get the, sorry, it's not coming up, but uh, nothing works. But uh, uh, just to, well, I may come back to it in a moment. But what happens is after they issued the interims, they had three months where they had, they had a further three profit warnings, and yet they achieved contract, they won contract after contract after contract, uh, billions of contracts after they issued a, this dramatic profit warning of 1.1 billion for a six month period. Mm -hmm. So after this warning was issued, they still uh, received huge contracts uh, uh, following that uh, following that profit warning. And that gave people comfort, didn't it? I suppose if we looked at the, the market, the market I think were already starting to feel a bit twitchy about... Um, the market started to feel twitchy in uh, kind of coming up to... Uh, coming up to the June, July results, and then of course it collapsed. And then this, uh, during this period is when uh, they won many, many contracts, many, many billions of contracts uh, uh, during this period. And then of course uh, the game was over in, in January 2018. But uh, it's, uh, what was interesting is, and, and, not, and not just uh, that they won contracts, many agencies were, were giving very positive spins on, on and, and positive ratings on Carillion. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? You know, I think for, for some of our um, clients who are looking at, at extending credit or, or entering into contracts, the market is famously fickle, isn't it? So I think you you look at the market and, 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 and think, well, is there some, some underlying problem here? But actually, if the good news is coming out, if, if contracts are still being awarded, that gives people confidence that actually there is more to the, the company and that they can ride through. That's the, right. And um, the previous the year they were doing so well and sales were growing and profits were looking good. No one focused on the balance sheet. Yeah. Uh, it was quite clear. And that's what you can see here. Yeah, and you can see there. So, what, so going back to, to, to some of our clients at the, um, at the, the time this was all happening, 
from, from March to, to June and then obviously the, the profit warning. Can you just show us what, what clients would have seen at, in Company Watch um, at, that, at, that, at that time in June? What would they have, what would they have been able to see? That's a so reasonably strong it's worth, bearing, yeah. it's worth bearing in mind that they actually, they actually made a loss of 1.1 billion. So if I, uh, so of course, by this stage, everyone knew there was trouble when the, once they issued the numbers. If I hide the interims, and show this is the results at December, which was similar to the uh, uh, to, uh, December 2016, similar to 2015. So solo profits, but continuing to have a weak balance sheet. If I did an experiment, if I, if, if I was looking at Carillion and I got wind that there was trouble, because even if you look at the equity profile, you could see the market was starting to pick up. There were some issues, not quite the collapse, but there were some issues going on with Carillion. If I said, if I go back to the accounts, if I said, well, I'm concerned that they're not going to achieve another uh, uh, operating profit of 180 women, if, uh, and, and I believe it could be a significant downturn. If I do an experiment, create an experiment, and I'll drop that not to 1.1 billion loss, but say a profit of an operating profit of 60 billion, 60 million, I should say, not 60 billion, 60 million, and I'll press calculate. And that, even if it just dropped to 60 million, it would have fallen into the warning area. And I didn't even allow this to flow into the balance sheet. They're showing already how vulnerable they are. Very vulnerable. The, I mean, the, the company is still with a lot of profit, uh, operating profit, and yet it's put it straight into the warning area. And that's just how vulnerable. And what I should have done actually is allow this to go into the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. but I didn't do it. Uh, but. Um, show how tight they were, how tight they were balancing. You know, the work cap was so evenly matched with the current assets and current liabilities. Everything had to work like clockwork. Mm -hmm. And the profits, they were very much relying on those profits coming through and dropping from whatever it was, 150 to down to 60 million was enough to put a straight into the warning area. And of course, the reality was that it, it was much, much worse. Much, much worse. Mm -hmm. So that really is the message, is, is that it was the balance sheet that was so disastrously weak that at any time a profit, there was any uh, doubt about the, the, the continuation of those profits, the company was very, very vulnerable. And, I mean, and with it, we know from our, from our um, conversations with, with clients, there are any number of, um, of large companies out there with this water skier profile um, and doing this kind of stress testing on the key risks is obviously something that we'd be very much encouraging people to do. And I think um, just looking there at the, the way you can see it in a graphic form is, is so much more powerful, isn't it, than That's just right. reading the numbers. So and, looking at the, um, uh, the, the balance sheet, we, when you ever see a profile like this, mm -hmm. with the balance sheet weak and the profits holding it up, yes, it brings it out of the warning area. But you know this company is totally dependent on those profits. And if those profits evaporate, uh, the company is in trouble. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. That was quite an interesting, um, interesting chat. Obviously, if you want any more information, do um, do give us a, a ring, and we'll we'll happily talk through any other um, any other water skier profiles that you might be concerned about. Thank you very much, Joe and Dennis. Thank you.